wrong with it? I guess you got an attitude about something. What up? So who is David? Don't play with me. I saw David sending you text messages. Why are you going through my phone? Don't try to turn this around. Who the hell is David? He's just somebody I work with. Why is he sending you text messages? And how did he get your phone number? Because we work together and he's nice. Nice? Nice. <laughs> oh, so you giving your numbers out to nice guys Well, maybe now. if you pay me some attention, I wouldn't have to give my number out to nice guys. Ah, right, here we go with that paying attention BS again. Feeling like winning. Ain't got a lot of time, but I know how to spend it. Girl, I went to the club last night. I was all the way turned up, okay? The girls who came in, but the men was appreciated. You feel me? Okay, whatever. Y'all old ladies can keep that very life, because I'm going to keep it single all the way over here. You guys hungry? You taking all day with them hamburgers? Don't walk away from me. Get off of me. Oh, here they go with this bullshit, man. They about to mess up the game. Hey, what's up, man? What's wrong with your girl? You ain't hitting it right. That's what it is. Man, shut up. You know how to bump uglies like me, you know? <laughs> and what's wrong with them hamburgers? Hey, uh, hey. Hey. Uh, what's wrong, girl? What do you do now? Girl, he mad that I gave my number to David. Who's David? Just a friend from work. Uh, did you forget you were married? No. He don't be paying me no attention. And David's nice. So I gave him my number. Mm. Mm. Don't do that. Mm. Because I'm not gonna do anything with him. It just makes me feel special. Hey, bro. Listen, man. Don't mess up the game today with all y'all drama. I don't know about you, but I'm trying to watch the game. Positive vibes only, man. Positive vibes only. Marriage, a union between two people as partners in a personal relationship. It's coming together as a team to achieve a common goal. Marriage is work, dedication, perseverance. It's enjoying the good times and working through the bad ones. Marriage is about being committed to the commitment. The commitment to a higher power, the commitment to family, but more importantly, the commitment to each other. Do you? Take your mate to live together in marriage, for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others for as long as you both shall live. I do. Or you want his story? I'm not feeling this process. <laughs> <laughs> so the way we met, I worked at Pepsi in New York and I had to do some marketing programs. And so I needed to pick three cities. I picked LA because it'd be fun to go hang out in LA. I picked Chicago because I'm from there and I want to be able to fly home. I picked Detroit because it's close to Chicago. I had seen her in the library a couple of times in the past uh, and, and glancing by, but she was just a guy. Now at this time, I had my moment because she was sitting at a long table next to a nun in full habit. Hi. No guys, okay. <laughs> and I kept looking at her. I was sitting with my, kind of my, my back to her and I had to keep turning around. I just could not study. I couldn't concentrate and I had to just meet this girl. See, so I felt, uh, that told me that there was something special going on in his head. We was walking and we walked past the store and I saw her in there. She was working at the store. 
So, I opened up and Angel started singing. So, um, you know, so she, of course, she saw me. And I mean, if, if y'all could have seen, her smile went from, a, when they say from ear to ear. And so, of course, me, I walked by playing her off, like, you know. It's, I felt like, literally, it just drawn like a magnet to her. And so I, I walked up to her, her, your head was down. So then you looked oh. up at me like, who is this jerk? Yeah, who's this okay. jerk? <laughs> then I saw his handsome face and I go, mm. And she melted and I melted. Our eyes met and that was it. So I would come here to Detroit and I would do all these marketing programs. And it'd be a Friday or Saturday and I'm like, I want to hang out. And I'd be in a hotel room by myself because I didn't know that many people here. So I met somebody who was a DJ here who I was like, let's hang out. He was like, I got to go home. I got my woman at home. I got kids. I'm like, I ain't trying to hook up. I just want to hang out. So he said, I'm going to introduce you to my friend. He knows everything in Detroit. He kind of like the mayor. I was like, oh, really? So this person introduced me to Lamont. She was going with somebody supposedly engaged at 18 years old uh, until she met her heartthrob, you know, like, uh, so, you know, we kicking in. She's like, I said, you can't get nobody your number. She's like, well, I guess because we were supposed to meet because her best friend at the time, she was supposed to. Um, she had been trying to hook us up since I was in high school. We met in college. Strange because the difference in our age, I was going to school on the GI Bill. She was just out of high school going to school. I was 18. Nobody asked the age. Well, you said there was a big, <laughs> you said there was a big gap in our age. Nobody said that. I saw this this young woman walked by, she had on scrubs. So that really caught my attention. Like, oh shit, she might be a doctor. Let me go, you know, shoot my move. You know, let me see what's up. So she had some popcorn in her hand and all that. So I looked at her, you know, and, and, and I already seen, you know, she was checking me out. You know, I saw her, she was noticing me. So I noticed her. Are you her. really gonna tell this story I'm, right? I'm telling the truth. Am I lying so far? Yes or no? Yes. What, what I lied about? Keep it moving. Okay, that's what I thought. My roommate worked at um, the church at the time that um, Josh and I met at, and she brought home a photocopy of Josh's license to our apartment because she had everybody's license scanned um, that we're volunteering for this program at church. And I pointed it, I pointed it out this one specifically, and I said, "Hey, he's cute." So she went and told him, like, "Oh, I know somebody that likes you." And I was mad because I was like, well, don't get his hopes up. I'm not sure that I, you know, like him. I don't even know him. I just thought that his license picture was cute. She approached me first. I didn't approach her first. She approached me first. Am I lying? Yes or no? How did I approach you? You I'm grabbed my down. arm. You grabbed my arm. I'm sitting down. You grabbed my arm. Yes or no? You grabbed right. me first. I was looking at, he had two tattoos on his arm. And I, I, I like tattoos. And I like the meaning of tattoos. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know what that meant. So you hollered first. How okay. could I holler first? You grab me. I... You grab me. You grab my you got All my right, attention. So one day, I was out looking good. We met in the club. And he was hosting. I was a guest. And he just saw me across the room and was like, you know what? I love her. I was not thinking about no relationship, no nothing. So I actually kind of played him to the left. And I let him All pick the up way on to the, the left. <laughs> All the way to the left. We met in uh, 1993 in high school said nothing else to each other ever again until 2008 oh, yeah. when I think um, she was all in my DMs on Facebook. Oh, my Why you, see, you let my hand go. You see, y'all see that? Did you see that? I asked her for a number and she's, she was busy. So she's like, get it from your boy. I didn't know she was dissing me, but I did get the number from my boy and I called her. And, and it was like three times we had these Two minute conversation, never called me back. Called her again, got something, boom, boom. All right, call me back, boom. So I said, I'm gonna call, call this you know, chick again, and if this don't go right, <laughs> then forget about it. So I called her and we talked for maybe five minutes this time. She said, I'm going shopping. So I'll call you when I get back. I didn't hear from this lady for like three months later. <laughs> okay, three months. And so when she called me, I said, oh, you just got done shopping? And she started laughing. And uh, we kind of been talking ever since then. Facebook comes along and we have like a million mutual friends on Facebook. And so somebody said something, it was a status. 
And so I commented and then he commented it and like 20,000 comments later, we like, hey, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. Then like three days later, I might have DM'd him. I don't remember. <laughs> Carla and two girlfriends were at a restaurant in Birmingham <clears throat> celebrating her uh, a big birthday of hers. And I happened into that establishment while they were there, sitting at the bar waiting for their table to come up so they could go and at dinner. And the way this place is configured is 90% of the tables are in the back and there's a couple tables in the front and the bar is between the two. So they got their, they, they were told that their table was ready, the three of them, <clears throat> and they got seated at the front and where there's just a couple of tables. So I, we was probably 10 or 15 minutes before I got ready to leave. And the fact that they were right there, they invited me to stay and have dinner with them. And I was alone. So <clears throat> as we've said well, before, it was a drink, not dinner. A, a drink it turned into <laughs> a, an, an entire evening together. I knew Monique's dad for, I knew her, him. I met him in 1979 when I was 10 years old. I would come home um, from school after I, after I went to school, moved to Atlanta to go to school, I would come home to visit. And <clears throat> he would always say, Drake, come on by here and pick up some money. So of course, I made that one of my regular stops. <laughs> he was my best friend at work. Like one day we yeah. bonded. Did you remember uh, Kang from... Uh, <laughs> oh, from uh, Menace to Society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we was having a hard day at work. We were having a hard day at work and I said it and he knew what I was talking about. I thought that was amazing. We met on a college campus of uh, Carbondale, Southern Illinois, my, where I went to undergrad. She came there for uh, a program for medicine. And uh, we met in physics, physics class. My very best friend was getting married and I was her maid of honor. And so uh, Larry's childhood friend, her then f fiance to be the uh, soon to be husband, they were having a party. So we ended up, uh, the bridesmaids and the bride ended up at the same party with the grooms and the groomsmen. And that night, I met Larry. And that night, he told me he was going to marry me. I would always hear him and my mother talk about his daughter. When she was, th remember how we talked about, you know, she was three years ahead of me. So when you're a kid, three years is a lot. And I was in eighth grade, and here she was, you know, talking about graduating from high school. I was like, oh, she a big girl. Uh, she was singing. She was with this other corny bald head dude. Um, and we noticed each other, but we never talked. And um, as fate would have it, several weeks later, we were both at church. It was the church that I grew up in and the church she had begun attending. And a mutual friend introduced us. I think probably, I was, I was married at the time. And, um, and we uh, crossed paths and we really didn't, you know how when you see somebody and you just, okay, how you doing? Keep it pushing, let's go. And that's basically how it was. That's but exactly then, how it was. Right, and over the, over the course of years, of course, I, I was married, she was married, and then we kind of reconnected probably about three, four years ago. I saw her sister on social media and I said hello and started talking, she said, uh, I'm not the one you were talking to. That's my sister. I said, <laughs> I know that. I'm trying to get your sister's number. <laughs> we met in college, blind date. It was our first and, and last blind date. And my roommate and her roommate are cousins, and they <clears throat> basically hooked us up. We were at a, a place called Pure Bar downtown. I was at a buddy of mine's party, and he invited both of us. And she and I got into a conversation. I was there with somebody else. We got into a conversation. And just as I was about to walk away, I turned back around, and because she had told me her name was Monique. I said, that's probably Monique Parnell. So sure enough, she was like, 
I'm Monique Parnell. And I was like, well, I'm Drake Fife. And she was like, I've been looking for you. Marriage, marriage is a wonderful institution. Marriage, uh, a good marriage and a real marriage is where each person has their needs met appropriately, yet at the same time puts the needs of the other first. I believe that marriage is a understanding, uh, a legal uh, connection between two people. I would describe it as a partnership with a great amount of understanding. To me, I would describe it as like, you know, that really hot sports car you always wanted. You finally signed the paperwork. It's yours now. You can drive it. It's wonderful. Absolutely. I am so happy. It's, she really is. He makes me very happy. He's a good we guy. Make... Marriage to me is getting to do life with your very best friend. It's like a good job that has like no weekends, no breaks, no overtime, no holidays. Um, and it, it really is what you make it. It used to be between a male and a female, but laws have changed and now it's just between two people, whoever those two people are. So there has to be in the United States a legal documentation, but in other cultures it may be a real uh, ritualistic thing that someone does. They may jump the broom, they may step on a, 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 a glass and those things signify the connection between the two people. For me, it was uh, one of those things where I lived most of my life as a single man, and I really didn't realize that I was running from marriage towards the end. You know, I was, I was not really, I was so accustomed to being on my own, although we had been together for three years, I was, still was, jittery over the concept, over the idea of getting married. A healthy marriage is one that people have learned how to uh, compromise and how to um, take self and sit it on the back seat and put the other person in the front seat. And so I think empathy, being able to stop and look at it from the other person's point of view is necessary for a healthy marriage and communication. You gotta be able to tell the truth not just slanted truth, but the truth. One thing about me, right? I am honest. I'm not going to lie. I don't you have, have to. Answer the question. Okay, let's just make sure we understand that. I don't have question. to lie. And tell the truth of when our first kiss was. <laughs> <laughs> was I that in the Jeep when we were listening to Donny Hathaway? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? Nope. Go ahead. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> Our first date was a great date. We had a wonderful time. Um, had dinner. We watched the Lakers. It was great. You remember what happened? Yeah. You stood there like, you know, waiting, mm. and I didn't kiss her. because <laughs> I didn't want to rush her. And she said, what's with this guy? She, said, she began to wonder. I'm standing there like this. <laughs> 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 he didn't anyway, get the hint. <laughs> so by the second date, it was a different story. <laughs> we parked the car at a nice dark spot, and we ha had a nice little smooching session there. Didn't yeah, we? little. <laughs> I really think our first kiss was probably my birthday. We went to Red Lobster. I still remember what I wore that day. Um, and I'm pretty sure that was the first kiss we went to Red Lobster for my birthday. You know, that was big back in college to go to Red Lobster for dinner. She was about to leave the house. Went that way, and I pinned her against the wall and told her, "You're gonna be mine." And started kissing, and the rest was history. She went and broke up with her so-called boyfriend, <laughs> fiance. So she gave me a hug. I hugged her, and then she gave me this big old kiss. Right, and I'm like, "Wow." That was a really big kiss for a first date. Where did I kiss you at? For somebody that you hadn't seen. And, Where did I kiss you at? You know, 15 some odd years I or so. I gave him a kiss on the cheek. 20 years. But it was a really big one. No. It was wet. So the first kiss, I think, was our first date. And uh, it was great. It was something I hadn't experienced. We went back to her apartment, and we were just hanging out watching movies. And, I mean, I don't really know how it happened. It's like... 
she she made she the move. Know how it happened. We she, were she made the move, right? And so that's the thing. It was like <laughs> those lights were off. There was a movie on. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, <laughs> actually she did. It so was me. It was her. She was aggressive. I'm, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. <laughs> Boy, would you? I'm telling you. I was drinking. Women, it's on the okay liquor. to go after what you Blame want. Blame it on the liquor. Long story short, no, go, go long. It was go my long. dad's birthday. Yeah. So so when he came to my birthday party, it was in February. Mm -hmm. My dad's birthday was in March. He was like, oh, so, you know, I want to see you again. I was like, well, I'm going to be in Chicago. Uh, I don't know if I said that. Oh, I know you said it. So okay. he flew to sh from Detroit to Chicago. I did, I did. Quick flight. We went out to dinner with my mom and dad, True. and then we decided to go to the 95th on top of the John Hancock Center. And we were standing in line waiting to go upstairs to have drinks. And he was just looking at me all starry-eyed. In fact, I saw the stars just kind of floating around his head, you know. It was kind of like, like orbits, you know. And he was looking at me, and I said, you want to kiss me, don't you? He was like, oh, I, oh, I don't know. You were all uncomfortable and stuff. Stars all coming. And I just kissed him just to make him feel comfortable. That's really what happened. That day was super special for me because in that moment, um, I remember Josh saying to me that, like, I'm not sure that we should kiss yet because it's so special. Like, maybe we should wait. And then we were just like, oh, whatever, you know? Like, we had just been there and we were just hanging out. And so we did end up kissing. And Josh ended up telling me that I was the only girl that he had ever kissed. And I remember in that moment feeling like, this is really special and I need to hold on to this guy because there's just, like, that's really rare to meet somebody who's waited a you know, for the right person to kiss. And I think that that, I just remember like feeling so special and so honored, like, oh my gosh, like Josh is like, you know, hadn't kissed anybody yet. Now we're kissing, this is great. I, I knew you were the one when we went to Vegas. I had never been to Vegas. We went on a trip to Vegas and um, we stayed at the Bellagio. And I remember looking out the window and I think you actually captured that picture of me. Yeah. And I was looking out the window and I was like, wow, I think this is supposed to be the person that I'm supposed to marry. The five phases of marriage start with the passion stage. And the passion stage is when you first connect with that person, it's that um, butterflies in your stomach. And actually what happens during that phase is that's when the whole attraction and you can't wait, it's almost you have a craving for the person. You can't wait to hear their voice. You, you want to touch them, you want to kiss on them, and there is a chemical cocktail that happens in your brain that causes you to almost simulate the feeling of being high. It's a euphoric feeling that you get. And so in that phase is when people are so giddy, they're so excited, they really can't wait to be with the person. But then the second phase happens, and that's the power struggle phase. And that's when you figure out what you don't like about the person. That's when conflict happens. That's when you understand that you don't see it from the same way. And so people have to learn how to fight, how to conflict, how to not see things the same way. And a lot of times during that phase is when relationships end. But the next phase is the permanence stage. And in the permanent stage, that's when you really get to the point that you have stability that you understand that yes, I'm attracted to this person, yes, I don't like everything about the person, but I know how to get past those places. And once you've learned how to do that, you can go back to that space of euphoria again, in and out of that stage. And then the next stage, which I think is so important, is the pledge stage. And in the pledge stage, that's when a couple really figures out that we're gonna have a family together, we're gonna impact our church or our community together so they know what their togetherness means to the community, the world around them. And then the last phase is the paradise phase. And that's when all of those things come together. You really understand why you like the person, what you don't like about the person and that you can see beyond that. And you understand working together, how you're going to change the world around you because you are with this person. So one day she invited me over and she said that she um, wanted to cook for me, right? When I went to my first city after we were together and I didn't make any phone calls, I said, okay, I think I'm in love. I think I'm in love. I, I didn't even pick up a phone to call to see if, yeah, what you doing tonight? Yeah, I got, as soon as I finished with this artist, uh, no, it was none of that. It was, let me call my wife and see how she's doing. 
his relationship with, with, with Shay, my daughter, that was the most important thing. Like, like I said, at the time when he, Shay came, when he came into my life, Shay was 16. TJ was 10. Um, but he grabbed a hold of her like that was his own child. We weren't together for about a year and a half. And um, during that time, I really had kind of resolved because it felt right to me. Like everything about our relationship felt right. Like the way we fit, how compatible we were. It felt really right to me. And I, I walked out of it like, okay, God, well, that felt right to me. But <laughs> maybe he just came to show me what he looks like. We were at her dorm and we were, um, there's a be Michigan beanbag she had in her room. And we were sitting on the beanbag and I said, I want to have a serious con conversation right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know we've only been dating a little little while, but I want to make sure that if we decide to move forward, that we start talking about things that this, th that we, you know, have a, you know, some type of match or that we agree on things in terms of, you know, where we want to go in life and, you know, have some similarities and what are our differences and how are they, you know, how are they compatible? Kari and I dating was very rare for me because I very rarely would like somebody right away. And he was a guy I liked right away. It was weird to, it, to talk that way in, in it college. It was very not college-esque. I mean, it wasn't. I'm telling you, he like sits down in the beanbag and we're like talking and you know, all of a sudden he starts hitting me with like serious like life questions. I'm like, we are like sophomores in college. Come on, we can't even drink yet. She came along at a point in my life when I was rebuilding my life. So it was like, I've lost a lot of things. I went through, I went through a bout of depression and I was rebuilding my life all over again from a failed relationship, failed business, uh, just a lot of stuff that was just, just fucking knocked me on my ass and just, I had to rebuild myself again. And the things that she was doing, I was missing from my past relationships or whatever. And she was just there. And all of a sudden, this plate comes to my table and it's some chicken parmesan with this buttery ass corn, right? <laughs> now I knew it was buttery before I tasted it because I saw the sweat coming off the butter. I'm like, okay, this looks serious now. I'm just hoping it's not dry when I cut into this, into this chicken parm. He would never let me get that far away. So every other month or so, he called me up and he'd say, hey. That's that Scorpio. How you doing? <laughs> And I would say, I, I'm doing great. And he would say, so, you know, we'd have this great conversation. At the end of the conversation, he would say, so you want to go to the movies? And I would say, nope. <laughs> and he would say, okay, well, I'll talk to you later. And I'm like, okay, I'll talk to you later. I never had anybody really pay attention to detail f for me like that in terms of like, preparing dinner like she really prepared dinner and so that went on for you know off and on for about a year or so and then when his friend called and said hey Tunisia we're doing this studio project we would love for you to be a, you know come check it out that night in the studio we were sitting there and I was watching him and I was like oh my god I still love this guy like I thought, went to the I, thought I was good <laughs> right and I had dinner and I ate it and it was delicious and I'm just like wow and I had like some red kool-aid with like more sugar than it should have been in it, which was phenomenal. I'm just like, wait a minute. I, I know she didn't measure the sugar. I could tell. She just poured it in there. I knew it, right? I'm like, man, okay. This might be serious. This might be serious because, you know, they always say a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Before I met her, I wasn't, I wasn't dating. I was, I was, I was I'm not going to say, wait, I, I was wild. I was out here. You know, me and my cousin would just go hang out and just, and just be, be wild or whatever. And she was the first person to come along after that. And it made me realize that, wow, maybe everything was happening for a reason. So it was like I, my career was going back going again. Uh, financially, I was getting back going again. And then I, uh, you know, started dealing with Tamika and I, I just saw a different side of life. We refer to that as the beanbag night because we did. We sat on this beanbag and talked like all night long. And I had, and he, he found this at one point, I had like a, pros and cons list um, for my ex and all the reasons why my ex was not a, a healthy relationship. But that also kind of got me to this thought process of, you know, why do I even need, like, I don't need a guy right now. I'm just going to have fun. I'm going to enjoy college. 
you know, this, it's been, this, the ex was a lot more pain than he was joy towards the end. So I really wasn't looking to get back into something else, but this conversation we had was so different than, I mean, it's the kind of conversation you have as adults. It's not the kind of conversation you have sophomore year in college. Remember when you were a kid and you used to blow bubbles? When you blow bubbles, certain things happen to the bubbles when they come out. Sometimes when the bubbles come out, they hit each other, they crash and burn. That ain't the person. If that person makes you irritated, agitated, you can't uh, talk to them. They, they belittle you. They don't make you feel uh, supported. That's a big red flag, pay attention to that. The second thing that uh, happens when bubbles come out, one bubble may stay small and the other bubble will encompass the other bubble. So the bubbles are still intact, but one is much bigger than the other and the other one stays small. You don't want a relationship where you stay small, the other person overtakes you. That's controlling, that is domination, that you don't want any of that. So you want a different type of relationship. The third thing that happens with bubbles is that the bubbles come out and they sit next to each other and they look like they're together, but that can be a misnomer because that is the type of person that you see them out, they're doing well together, but at home they're sleeping in separate beds, they don't talk to each other, and so that's not what you want. But when you really connect with the person that is yours, those bubbles come together and when they hit, they create one big bubble. So a person should enhance your world, they should better your world, that you should come together and you feel like, I am better at what I do, I'm better at being the whole me, because this person has come into my life. It took me a while. Um, there was a lot of um, uneasiness at first. I was like not, it was about me. Like I wasn't sure about myself and I would, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be in a relationship. I had wanted one for so long and now that it was here, I was terrified by the, the process, I think. I remember even telling Josh like, I'm not, I'm not sure if I like you. Like, I mean, this was after we kissed. Yeah, was this was nice. after we kissed. We, like, were sitting on my apartment floor, and I was like, I, I just don't know. And he was like, okay, I'll just wait it out. In the beginning, I told him that I didn't, I had made the choice that the next, I'm not going to just be dating. Like, you know, he had said he really wasn't ready to kind of get into a serious thing. And so I said, okay, well, you know, I'm not really, really trying to wait that long, you know. <clears throat> so... We had had another conversation and I was just kind of like, dang, I, I would kind of feel some kind of way if this didn't happen to go anywhere. And I think at that moment I was like, okay, I think I might, I might kind of like him. Like I, everything about it just was really organic. It was like a spiritual experience. It really, to this day, it was like we felt, I felt, and I think it, like the hand of God just said, Go meet this person. This is your soulmate. This is the one you've been waiting for. And that was the feeling. There was never any doubt. I mean, I knew pretty quickly that's what I wanted, but it, it took a while for me to be ready to propose. I mean, and a lot of it really was the family things. Like, I mean, I think when she was ready, she was ready and like, now I want to get engaged. And so there were, there were times where like, <laughs> we, went to, we went to a Wings game and she wanted me to propose. And someone else like proposed at the Wings game. And so I remember like sitting at a Wings game and like she's crying and I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do about this? Where were we? We were down your folks' basement in their recreation area. We spent a lot of time in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> I proposed over pizza. You know, I ordered some. <laughs> I kept on uh I kept on trying to do something real nice and romantic. I don't want to go there tonight. I don't want to do this. I'm like, oh, I had this stuff all planned out in my head. <laughs> So it was back here at the house. But why? What was wrong with me? Oh yeah, she was pregnant. I was pregnant. Yeah, yeah she was pregnant. And so he proposed on the side of the bed <laughs> while I was laying down. I just said, will you be mine? <laughs> <laughs> Where were we? Where were we? In the bedroom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the house. And he got on his knee without a ring. Once he said we're getting married, he was getting ready to, you know, go off to Harvard to law school. So I said, well, I need an engagement ring. And he said, do you know the diamonds that people wear are for off the brothers in Africa and I'm just not gonna contribute to, you know, to that. You know, so 
I said, but can I have a wedding ring? He said, if you can find a wedding ring for under a hundred dollars, I'm, I, you can have it. You can, I'll get it for you. I knew, mm-hmm. and I had already picked out the ring. I really love my ring, and I wanted, um, I wanted this to be it, and I wanted mm-hmm. the ring to show that it was it. So I, so it was basically he just kind of waited on a day and mm-hmm. decided. You know, he didn't tell me the day, but it wasn't you know anything like where it was like <clears throat> flash mob or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. I did this little elaborate scheme. Um, up in Harlem, New York, there was a place that Mark Samuelson opened called the Red Rooster. It had just opened up. It was a new hot spot. You couldn't get a table. You couldn't do whatever, whatever. So I hooked it up and with, with my man Bobby Duckett. I forgot how he did it, whatever, whatever. But I had her meet me over there. No, 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 no. You're wrong. <sighs> Needless to say, I found 14 karat gold. Wedding band, wedding ring with the little itty bitty diamond, and his wedding band for eighty dollars. The place was going out of business. It was on East Jefferson. I ordered some pizza, and I had the pizza come in, and I um, opened the box up, and I was, you know, I opened the box, put it on the plate. And right here in the kitchen. And then I bent down. Um, I was like, what is this on the floor? And then, and I had the ring there. And I was like, oh, it's a ring. I said, oh, I, you know what? I, I guess the, the delivery guy must have left this. He must have dropped this. And she was like, what, what are you talking about? I was like, I think he, he meant it for you. And then I put it on. And she was like, oh, okay. You know, so she was, she was, uh. She was surprised, and it was it was cool. I mean, I I I I fumbled the ball a little bit when I did it. It wasn't as smooth as I had envisioned it, you know. But man, you know, it it, it was um, it's one of those things where it was the best thing that I could have done, and I didn't even realize it at the time. I told her. She said, "Would you like a drink of the pop?" I said, "Sure." So she went upstairs to get you get going upstairs to get me a drink. Yeah. And then I, in the meantime, took the ring out of the diamond box with the diamond and opened up the box and put it out of my pouch and put it on the table. So she comes down and she puts down the glass and then she goes like that. And you were in shock. And oh my. And she started shaking and she got all teared up and happy. Can you imagine seeing a ring sitting at a table? So sweet. I had gone to the dentist. We were supposed to go to our favorite restaurant in New Jersey. We were going to Grassini's. And so I hadn't eaten all day because I wanted this pasta, and I just okay. That might that might have been right. It was right. I know. I couldn't wait, and so I met him at the Time Warner Center. He was supposed to pick me what? up. You were supposed to pick me up, and he calls me because I drove the blue car, right? Drove, I had the convertible, right? Car. Yeah. And you said Bobby Duck is with me. I'm like, why is he? Okay, with that's us? what Bobby was in the mix. I was okay. like, Bobby don't need to be here. We going to Jersey. He's like, yeah, we got to make this run. I don't, I'm not trying to make a run with him. I'm trying to go to Jersey and have some dinner. Okay, I remember that part. So we get I knew Bob was in there some kind of way. We get in the car. We go to Ashford and Simpson's Club. And there you so got the some. The sugar bar? The sugar bar. And you no, are, yes, no. We, yes, that we wasn't did. the you same are, day. Yes, it was. You are so wrong. That wasn't the same so day. You are so wrong. You're wrong. I went to the rooster before you no, did because. Well, you went to the rooster before that. With uh, B. Smith's husband. That, no. Okay, she's right. I, no, that's right. I'm always right. Once again, we was at Northland. <laughs> It was so great. And because I, I wanted to do it, I wanted to do something different. So I, I wanted to do it at the place where I met her at. So I wanted to, you know, do some old romantic shit, some cornball shit. So it was at the time she was sick and she was at work. So I was like, hey, before you go to, before you go home, meet me at Northland. I need you to come to Northland right quick. I got something I want to, you know, meet me at Northland. You got to come to Northland. It's something I want to get. So I got to, no, you got to, I need you to pick up something. Yeah, I need you to pick up something. The place is so crowded because yes, Puffy's over there. Yeah. Because it just opened. And all these other, Bevy Smith, my girl, is over there. And I'm like, I was supposed to eat two hours ago. But this is supposed to be the hot spot. I'm in Harlem. You know what I'm saying? I'm, they sit I'm, us I'm, at I'm a table. I'm trying to relive these earring days. You know yeah, what I'm well, saying? Yeah, whether relive or not, I'm like, I'm hungry. 
she finally came after all the fussing and all that, and she was like, I what, almost what went is home. It? Yeah, she almost went home. So I was like, what, I was what is it? What is it? And so, I was not feeling and good. And so it was my boy Ali with me, too. So I was like, Ali, this is what I got to do. We got to do it this way, and I need to set it up. Okay, let's do it. And so I got on my knee, and I asked her to marry me and all that. And this month, yeah, no plan. In the store. Yeah. yeah in I, in I, the I, store, not yeah, out yeah, on the yeah, bench. Yeah, yeah, but. Yeah. So, and so it was funny because this motherfucker ain't even cry. I went through all this shit. <laughs> 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 Went through all this shit, hooked up the fairy tale shit. I was shit. sick. So Lamont, co- I see these people with these video cameras come out. And I was like, oh, they're about to go film Puffy. He's sitting over there. And they come to me. And I'm like, yo, no, 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 no. I don't, no filming, please. No, none. And they're like, no, no, no. So then here comes Lamont trotting out the bathroom. I swear I'm like, you know, I, I don't have thought, an earring, though. He no thought earring. he was trotting earring, out. Yeah. And he gets on one knee. And I'm like, you OK? And I'm like, did you fall? He was like, no, you know, I'm wondering, you know, no, no. What did you say? You said, uh, Hell, I don't know what that you said is. something, tried to be a little slick, you know. Oh, it's showtime. Yeah, I did it's say that. No, no, give me some. You, you did, right. you said I did, that. I did, I did, I said it's showtime. It's showtime. Yeah, that's what's up, I did do that. So will you marry me? Yeah, 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 I did that. And I was like, well, pull out the hardware, yeah, dude. I did say that, I, I did say that. I said, and get up so your ass don't fall. That's right, she right, I did, she did say that. I'm. I'm ready. I'm like, but I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something unique. I'm going to do something special. So I'm talking to my friend and I'm saying, this is what I want to do. I want to propose to her on the ambassador bridge because yeah, the one between Canada and the United States where people aren't allowed <laughs> that one. You know, it's uh, like Christmas, Christmas Eve, Christmas day. Yeah. Christmas day. I put the ring in, uh, the, uh, Christmas stocking, hid it. And then, uh, Hit it and, and a couple of things so that, you know, she had to get to it. And then I she went through the uh, stocking and pulled it out, you know, and opened it up. And then uh, that's when I was on the knee and ass, you know. So, oh, wait a minute. Hold yeah, up. Let's back up. <laughs> so out in Canton is before they had all them houses out that way. Um, it was like a lot of, you know, uh, what was it called? Woods. Woods and stuff. And so I went out there ahead of time and I hung this big old sheet in the tree and said, will you marry me? So I took her out there. So when I turned down and went down the dirt road and she, we knew it was private, she's like, what are we doing? You know, I, I don't know if she maybe thought I was trying to kill her or something. I but, did, I'm looking <coughs> like, this, 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 this so, don't look right. And then as we got <laughs> closer, I'm like, look, you know, and she looked and seeing that said, will you marry me? He got me a blender and a, uh, a food processor for Christmas. And I was like, a blender and a food processor, this is good, because I had been cooking a lot. But a blender and a food processor for Christmas, okay, this is interesting. So he's like, you're not gonna open your stocking? I'm like, okay. So I go to open the stocking, digging candy. I dig this box out and there's nothing in it. And I'm thinking, what the hell is going on? He had hidden the ring actually in the desk behind him. So when I turned around, he got the ring out of the desk and was on his knee. There was a moment where I was living back at my f- folks' house after college. After the, you know, it was five years in. Now we were out of college, and there was times when she was coming over the border, or I was coming over the border, and so it was a really monumental type of uh, representation of our relationship coming together. And so I was like, "That's where it's going to be. And I'm going to do it." And so I said to my friend, "You're going to drive me over." I'm gonna hop out of the car with my sign because she's gonna pick me up at this time at my house. And I was coming after work on a Friday night to come pick him up. And so I said, I'm gonna jump out and hopefully she comes over at the time that she said she's coming over. I'm gonna hold up the sign, stop her, and make sure <clears throat> that uh, she knows that this is this is it. I wanna I wanna commit and marry her. Um, we had dinner at a very nice restaurant. And I was nervous, you know, we drive to the dinner. I got a ring in my pocket. She told me that I was acting real weird on the way to the restaurant. And and she was right. And the restaurant was packed. So everybody was kind of looking at me in the restaurant. Like it just got quiet in the whole building. Everybody just started looking at me. So I did a toast to my friends, said thank you for coming out. Then I say, um, and Laquita, you know, to you, I just want to say, um, thank you for being, you know, um, such a great um, um, partner to me. Um, our relationship has been great. I really enjoyed all the times that, that we share together. And, and I love you. Yep. And I said, and I love you. And I said, 
And right now, I'm ready to take this to the next level. So I'm driving Literally, across. She, she, she's coming. I'm driving. And at first, there was almost a moment where I was going to take the tunnel because things had gotten a little goofy with traffic. And I'm coming from work. It's a Friday. I, I, I My brain's going about all the things that are happening that day, that weekend. And I'm driving over. And what I look and I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's a person on the bridge. Like, it kind of startled me. Like a, like a single, not construction, just a guy. And I'm looking. I'm like, the guy has a sign. I'm like, that's my guy on the bridge. And then I stopped and actually like read the sign and saw what was going on. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I pull over. I stop my car. He gets out. He proposes. I get down on one knee. Everybody's like, oh my God. Oh. So I asked her to marry me. She just lost it. She couldn't talk. She was crying. It was so unexpected because it was on my birthday. So it was very selfless, right? I gave her the ring and literally as this is all happening, people are like, what the heck is going on? Why are people stopping? With all of a sudden, burp, two cars, another car rear ends another car. So the um, bridge, you know, people come driving up, realizing border patrol, border patrol realized <laughs> there was an accident. And this guy realizes that I'm on the bridge and, all and of a sudden, he's, he's, he's deciphering all, all the things that are happening right now. And he's like, oh, they're getting, they just got engaged. And he's like, okay, you guys need to get out of here right away now. before someone comes. <laughs> before you get arrested, that's what he told him. So how long were you on the bridge before you got there? Uh, probably about 10 minutes. We were in Las Vegas and we had talked about marriage before. And mm -hmm. we were in Las Vegas. And we just decided this was a good time to do it because her parents were there in Las Vegas with us. Her grandparents were there. And we just decided rather than try to get everybody back together again, we'll do it now. It was Cincinnati Music Festival. Mary J. Blige was supposed to perform that night. But uh, and I had planned that out like, you know what? Just don't bring her out. Uh, just come to the concert. Her mother was there. My mother was there. My brother, her my brother, sister. Her family was there. You made sure everybody was there. Made sure everybody was there. So I'm like, right, how am I going to do this? So um, there was a thunderstorm in Cincinnati and Mary J. Blige couldn't land. So she ended up not performing. She ended up not performing. I had been at work all day. My, I didn't have an idea of what was going on. I, it was raining. It was so raining. I was automatically like, I'm not. She was ready to go. I'm not coming. I'm like, he was on. like, you better come out and get all these tickets. <laughs> yeah. Your sister, your mama, everybody here, you better. And I'm like, oh. Okay, I got rain on, so the whole time I got an attitude like I'm ready to go. I knew at that point in time, um, after maybe the second or third date, I said, well, yeah, I think I want to I wanna make her, you know, my wife. And I asked her, I said, well, if I asked you to be my wife, you know, what would you say? She said, I don't know, you ain't asked me. <laughs> and so what I, what I did first, and um, I, cons I asked, can I speak with her daughter uh, first? And... Um, at that time, her daughter knew of me, but, for, but she knew her mom was talking to somebody, but she didn't know who I was. I had to lie to her. I'm like, yo, I went out to the crowd. I got, I said, come back stage. We're going to meet Mary J. Blige, knowing that Mary J. Blige wasn't coming. So I got up on stage and uh, proposed in front of 30,000 plus people. Getting on my knee was the hardest thing in the world to do. At the time, we both really liked Cata Lilies, the flower. Just thought it was pretty. And... Um, she uh, had an apartment over by the Eastern Market. And of course, I would hang out there all the time. And um, I decided that uh, I would figure out a way to surprise her. So I came up with a reason to hold her car for a day. I was going to take her to work, um, set it up so that early in the morning I could come and get the car. I bounced over to the Eastern Market, bought two Cata Lilies slip the ring on the stem, put it in the passenger seat. My son and I, we go to the mall. And um, so we go to the jewelry store, like I'm green. Like, I don't, I don't know what it, I had to ask the lady like, so, you know, where are your engagement rings? And like, as soon as I said that, she was like, oh yeah, come on over here. Like, they, you know, cause I don't know, rings are rings to me, you know what I mean? So she showed them to me and I had my son with us and, uh, and uh, you know, so he he actually like gave like final call. Like he was like, I like this one. She comes out, she opens the door, and it's sitting right there on on the seat. Um, got the reaction I wanted. And yes. then I look down, and he's like on his knee in the parking lot. I'm like, you in the parking lot? Like I caught her like in the kitchen, 
just doing some random and I just presented yeah. her with everything and you know got on one knee you know corny like you know like the rest of the world does and you know proposed to her she, then she she said yes of course and then she yeah, <laughs> just started you know just started tearing up the phones with the uh with the twitter and and the facebook and you know she was like well we gotta set a date i said well we can do that this year she said huh this, this year it's i like, said what? why are we waiting one thing i think that really made our our union even more evident for me is that we didn't do it like a lot of the a lot of the people are doing it now we wanted to wait to move together. We wanted to uh, wait till we got married to buy a home, uh, to get a home and everything. So we took, we did it the way we felt that it was supposed to be done in the Bible. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't push off, um, you know, any type of, um, put things in place that a lot of people look now would live together two or three years and we'd think about getting married. We mm -hmm. said off the rip, if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. We're gonna make it happen. And that's what we did. And it's been like, heaven ever since. I would definitely suggest that every couple do premarital counseling before they get married. It was very helpful in, you know, having us examine some things before we made that decision. And, um, you know, we decided it was still for us, but it just really forces you to take a look at the situation because it's a lifelong commitment. I think the premarital counseling is great um, because it started getting you to think on other stuff that you, you go into it with your heart. The biggest thing he told me that I would have to worry about, or not necessarily worry about, but I would have to be more conscious of, was the fact that I've been by myself for so long. Mm -hmm. And I've raised my girls basically by myself for so long that I'm gonna have to kind of give up my, what would I say? Yeah, my independence. Because I'm so used to doing everything on my own I don't wait for anybody. It's only been me and my girl. So yeah, that, that was the biggest thing and I still kind of struggle with it today. I would say the biggest thing that really they drilled into us was about money and about talk about your money and be upfront about how you're gonna spend your money. Make sure that somebody in the family is responsible or between us is responsible for running the budget and um, and they, I, I just remember hearing all the time that so many couples fight about money and I just didn't want that for us. Um, so we, we, even before we got married, we, we sat down and did like a budget on Excel and we talked about like how much money are we each bringing in and how much money are we going to save and how much credit card debt do we have. And we were very, very, very open with each other. I think as soon as we got engaged, yeah. we kind of wrote it all out and talked about what we wanted to do with our money and I think that was probably the biggest takeaway for me from premarital counseling. Reverend Opal Simmons. Reverend Opal, yeah, she God rest her soul. God rest her soul. Yeah, she yeah. said she talked a lot about talking, being kind, speaking kind to one another even in the you know the hottest mm. moments. I remember that, yeah. And the you know heat of things and that always to use your words to build your relationship and not to tear your relationship down and I actually think that one of our biggest attributes in our relationship is that we can really have the hard conversation. Like mm -hmm. we really get to the, we try to get to the core. Like we try to, you, you know, we try to hear each other. We do try to, we don't always hear each other, mm -hmm. but we really attempt to hear each other. And there's no, I, I don't think, I feel like there's no subject I can't, broach with him. I think premarital counseling is important because it helps to bring out questions that you may not have on your own. And I think that all of us have a place that we may need some direction because oftentimes when we get into a relationship, we emulate what we've seen. Because the number one way to, to learn a social or a behavioral skill is by modeling. So you have to understand what your models have been. And so those models, when they come together and they're not the same, they will clash. So sometimes the outside person can help you navigate what a relationship is gonna look like between the two of you. Not your parents, not their parents, not your girlfriends, not what you see on TV, but specifically for the two of you. But the caution is, when you see red flags in your relationship, 
Don't say to yourself, well, I'm going to work that out in counseling because you may not work it out in counseling, especially if you're not married. Red flags mean something. So if someone is mean to you and they say things that's short to you, don't think that when you get in front of a pastor or you get in front of a counselor that that person is going to stop being mean because if they mean, they mean. I'm so fresh as hell, I got the feds watching. I'm so fresh as hell, that's why your girl jacked me. Hey, nephew. <laughs> so, wait, you ain't right? Wait, wait, what is any of right? Who brought him? Hey, man, so what y'all arguing about this time? He doesn't pay me any attention. All he does is work, come home, play those stupid video games, scroll through Instagram, and watch sports all day. Have you talked to him about it? Yes. And it goes in one ear, not the other. Have you guys tried counseling? Girl, black people don't go to no counseling. Why not? Listen, girl, if he's hitting it right. Shut up, what? Stupid. Okay. So what? What is it? No. <laughs> it's not that. It's... Look, y'all, I'm tired. I'm just, I don't want to feel like I'm in this marriage by myself. I want to do things. I want to do things together with my husband. And sometimes I feel maybe I married the wrong person or... Maybe we got married too soon. She's always going off on me about paying her attention. Oh! You ain't hitting it right. It's Shut it up! I wanted to go play ball. Y'all asked me to go. I go to work. I come home. I play the game. I watch the game. We're always together. What else does she want from me? This is the thing about arguing. I believe that in order to have a discussion, you have to begin to say, I agree to disagree agreeably. The biggest problem in most couples or any person when it comes to a disagreement is that we don't listen. We hear, but we don't listen. Listening is a skill. Hearing is a bodily function. So I can hear you, but I haven't listened. And so in order to listen, you have to calm, just calm yourself and pay attention to what the other person is saying. And before you form your rebuttal, say back to the person what you just heard them say. Nine times out of 10, that ain't what they say. The main thing that bothers me about Ty is when some shit going down, I'm like, what the hell? You know, he be, okay, wait a minute, you know, um, and all this all mess. But the stupidest shit, he just, yeah, you know, and la, la, la. And I just be like, Ty, what is you talking about? That wasn't even nothing. The toilet paper oh my is God. supposed to go here and over and down. A picture could fall. Oh, fuck that. Why the picture fall? The motherfucker wasn't even hammered in right. You didn't hammer this shit in right in this. And, 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 and it could be a fucking earthquake and the fucking fucking picture fell because the fucking house shook. <laughs> any hotel that you've ever been to, That's any for decorative purposes. It is my turn. Everything is critique. No, I, have, I question a lot of things. No, it's critique. No, it's I critique. question. I just be a lot of asking don't you need if you to be, do something, a lot, like, a lot what of things don't thinking need to be about questioned. what you did? A lot of things need to be questioned. It's just like, shit just happened. It just happened. No, I fuck, just want to know why the, fuck you, why the fuck you thought that why was Why you okay? fart? Because I ate. You fart all the time. Yeah. And it drives me crazy. And this is what he'll do. He'll go, I'm sorry. You have never seen the toilet paper go under like this and fall like under the roll part and fall. That, that bothers that me. That is ridiculous. It's, that, it's insane. Anytime I deal with any of her family, no, I'm messing with you. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no. Me hanging up the curtain. My wife has no concept of time. And just, it's always been like that. And that's why I will never buy her a watch because she never gonna be on time. You the can curtains. be mad at me about the curtains all you want. The you curtains. needed a drill I bit. Am. You needed a drill bit. <laughs> there was a, she woke up one morning this was the morning I was going to go. No, was it the morning? Yeah, it was the morning I was going to go on the road. She Stop woke up. Stop trying to make me look like the bad guy. Like, and there was a, there was a dog, a dog outside. She, oh, she, I'm 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 in there asleep or doing my morning thing, getting ready to go work out, and she walks in with this dog. I'm like, what in the world? Where, where's you? I almost ran he him was, over. Uh, he was outside and almost ran him over. It's raining outside. I want to bring him in. Man, you can't just bring somebody else's dog in here. <laughs> I said, I'm going to go out of town. You're going to go to work. What? Where are we going? Oh, we could just leave it in the basement until whenever. So she she took the dog back out. I left. 
went to go work well, out. Why did I take the dog back out? Because I told you to. See me. Why would you let the dog go back outside? Because it, it wasn't ran, our dog. It could have got ran over by a car. It wasn't our dog. But that's mean. Why would you do that? Somebody was looking for that dog. Something has to be wrong with your brain if you think that that is how toilet paper is supposed to go. Where have you no, been? Have you ever been anywhere? My wife will go to bed with dishes in the sink if she just don't feel like cleaning. But I always put dishwashing liquid and water on top that so that, that, that you're never matter. gonna have smelly dishes in, or anything. In my like home, that. you don't go to bed without the dishes being cleaned. Well, that's clean. why you wash them. So I went to go work out. She's at work supposedly. <laughs> I come home from working out and I hear, <laughs> like, what? I said, I went downstairs and the dog is back. <laughs> Why would I leave that dog? It was raining. It was cold. That's me. Um, probably the, and I will um, say right up front that I see this has been passed down from her sister. And that is um, my sister's probably the fact that this, she so. the <laughs> fact that she sits next to me in the passenger seat of oh. the car and refuses to let me drive without directions. She wanted to do something special for me, and we, of course, had very little money. I was just on a little we stipend. We had no money. At the time, she wasn't working. Very little, it means no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Besides that, she's a stand-up comic, but I decided on impulse that I wanted to buy a better camera. Oh. So I went out. Oh, did we I have a fight? Well, they didn't have a fight. It was a one-way street. Didn't you street. hear it? And I'll tell you what happened, because she threw me out of the house. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I brought home the camera, <laughs> and I showed it to her, and she said, what's that? I said, it's a camera. How much did you pay? I said, $200. She said, what? Oh, <laughs> and, I, thought was, I was going to kill him. And she was right, because $200. we could we Who could Ill, $200? We could ill afford it. Besides, she comes. Oh, now she, we can ill afford it. Now he says we can ill afford it. <laughs> you should hear what anyway. I said to him. She cooked the first dinner and I had it out all on the table and I grabbed my plate, fix it, and I go sit in the TV room and turn on the TV. I'm like, She's oh, that like, did not just happen? What are you doing? I was like, I'm, I'm eating dinner, watching TV. I'm like, no, we're going to eat at the Why table. Come and, and watch. Like, he's like, why? And I'm like, because we sit at the table and we're going to talk. I clean up the kitchen, right? So we have these nice stainless steel um, sink. Thanks. With the nice, uh, what you call it, marble, whatever. So I done wiped everything down. It's shining. She know I got the kitchen clean. Here she come with a glass. She turned the water on. Just splashes everything. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself in the beginning. I'm like, okay, these people have never been anywhere. So this is caveman shit, right? I'm thinking like, okay, Captain Caveman, like shit like that. So I'm like, okay, now I got to kind of bring these young ladies up to snuff. Uh, oh. On how toilet paper is supposed to be on a roll. This is unbelievable. You, we never wanted to be wrong. So even on those little things where really it didn't matter, right or wrong, you just, you think this, I think this, let's leave and go. We just would battle. Yeah. I mean, we just constantly always had to be right. And we'd, and trying to be right over this little thing would, would turn into seven other things that we're fighting about. And then you can't remember what we were arguing about in the first place. Right. The best way to communicate is the best way for you. And this is the thing. That's why you have to understand that different personality types handle communication different. There's only four types of people. Each type of person handles communication differently. You have people people. They love people and they wear their feelings on their sleeves. So they are loving, they're kind, they want to hug, they want to kiss. That's just how they navigate relationships. That's how they navigate how they communicate. Then you have your organized, structured, dependable people. And so those type of people love rules. They love order. They want to write things down. They want to check things off. They want to come up with a plan. They're going to put it on a schedule. They want to do all. And that is how they're going to communicate. They don't want to touch right now. Don't touch me. Let's talk about it. Then you have your heady people or your visionaries or your intellectual people. And so they're the ones that's gonna come up with data says this, research says this. They wanna to get to the bottom and the, where it comes from and why is it so disturbing for you and things of that nature. They're gonna go deep in their communication. And then the last are our spitfires. Those are the ones that cuss, 
they the ones that may throw something, they the ones that may kick something because they're so passionate when they're in their feelings or when they are communicating. So you have to one, know what your communication style is and then how to communicate with the person who is communicating oftentimes opposite from you. Being in this life and having him probably notice me, you know? I know that's like, it's not like a little, like the little things probably are what, for me, it's like, hey, notice me, I, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You know, people always say, you gotta work at it. You gotta work at it. I never really felt like it was work, you know? It was never work, even when we got on each other's nerves, you know? I miss that. Like, even like, even, uh, you know, since Monique passed, I imagine her, I sometimes bring her voice into my head, screaming at me something, get that, get that up, get this, you left this there, you left that there. It's a motivating force, you know what I'm saying? Like, there are certain things that men do that they, that they do when they're single that they will not do when they have a wife. The fact that he'll sit here on his phone and come home and not notice that, you know, that bothers me. I'm at a point now that I'm trying to figure out what my life is going to look like moving forward. You know, I mean, I, I think that the one most common thing that people do in marriage, I did it, many other people do it, it's a human uh, tendency, and that is to take your mate for granted. I heard somewhere, read somewhere, someone told me. I don't remember where that information came from, but it essentially is that you both have to be willing to, to put in the work and make sure that you both are not giving up at the same time. So as long as one person is willing to put in the work, that other person will come around at some point. I, I miss the mundane things the most. It's not, it's not the... Um, it's not the big memories. It's not the the things that you know were accompanied by all the fireworks, all, all the glitter, and all the shine. It was just the mundane kind of things, the day-to-day -day stuff. I loved getting up every day um, and c having a cup of coffee. You know, we both like um, Bustelo coffee, which I hardly ever make it now. You know, there's certain things that I feel like are just reserved for Monique, and I've, I've had it a few times, but it's, it, for some reason it doesn't taste the same, you know, um, you know. What? Yeah. You wanna stop? Oh, uh, we could, we're good, we're good, we're good. Taking a step back from uh, the relationship and, and understanding whatever challenges you may face, if you have the trust in your partner and the love for your partner, understanding that their approach and how they may handle you or talk with you or um, engage with you is from a place of love and um, a desire to protect and keep you. And if you are not um, willing to be on that same page, then you may not necessarily be able to move forward in that relationship. And I. I believe at one point it finally hit me that in order for us to be able to um, continue to communicate and move forward I have to always remember that he has my best interest at heart. You know earlier when I talked about the five stages most people get married within the first stage and that's when you're still kind of honeymooning and loving and ooh, 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 and then the power struggle stage happens that's when most people get divorced because they haven't learned how to fight. And they was like, who, what, who is this person? That ain't the person I've been knowing for the last three years and you didn't ever talk to me like that and you ain't never done that. So you have to understand that you're gonna get to that stage. And once you get to that stage, you have to um, be open to communicating differently, getting support, getting help. But if you don't, then you're gonna be in trouble. So I, I, don't, I don't know how long, cause some people, I, I remember, and this is a, a horrible example, but a real example. I remember I was speaking at a women's conference and a lady came to me and said that she was in her 70s. And she says that while I was speaking, God told her that she could share her truth with me. She pulled me over to the side. She says, I've been married to my husband for 50 years. I've never loved him. 
I married him because my family wanted me to marry him. The person that I loved, my family didn't like, so I didn't marry him. She says, but I want to love him before we die. So I gave her some things to do to begin to love her husband after 50 years of being together. And so that was a retreat. So every year I would be one of their speakers for their retreat. So the next year when I came to the retreat, the lady was there. I didn't even recognize her. She looked so different. She dressed differently. She, she, her hair was done differently. She had a little makeup on. I said, all right, mother. And she says, I did exactly what you told me to do. Thank you. And she just hugged me. And so you never know where a person is. But when a person is ready, the help will appear. If he has a dime, it is burning a hole in his pocket. Like, like right now, there are yeah, holes hold, hold, all hold, in hold, his pocket. Up, yeah, you don't want me to show everybody your holes in the pocket. Because I'm telling you, he'll be like, hey, I got a check. And I'll be like, just hand that over. <laughs> Let's put it in the account. Because if not, that check is going to be gone in two days. I was always poor at taking care of business. So I brought the check home. She brought her check home, but she kept both checks. I you told know? him I would spend whatever I wanted and he didn't have anything <laughs> to say about it. <laughs> I go to the bank, if there's money in there, good. If it's not, oh boy. <laughs> Finances is one of the top five reasons that people get a divorce. First, I think that couples should really have a discussion about who's best with money. And if neither of you are best with money, because that's possible, that both of y'all got a jacked up credit score and don't know how to handle money. You might make good money, but if you don't know how to handle money, you'll never be able to keep anything. So you have to first be honest with yourself about how you handle money. Then as a couple, decide how are we gonna build our finance future together? Are we gonna have separate accounts and then one account that we both put money into? Some people do it that way. Some couples just have a joint account and everything goes into the account. But it begins with honesty and trusting the partner to do what they say they're going to do. It was going to be the death of our marriage. Finances were important, but because the, the environment and the lessons weren't always there, we were taught to save, but let's take it to the next level. How do we invest and how do we grow? He grew up with a you know, servant leadership, family, um, mother who was a principal, father who was a police officer. She came from a family where, you know, that was an extremely important mm -hmm. piece and had very good lessons in terms of investing and growing your money, not just saving, but learning how to grow it beyond you know, a bank account where there might not be a lot of interest. I grew up with this sense of you have to be able to take care of yourself at all times. You have to have security. You don't spend all of your money. You save your money. You invest your money. Like money is a tool. Devon, you had more free spirited, you know, when it came to money. And mine, you always were saving. And early on, he challenged me to see that sometimes you need to spend and you need to live. Tunisia and I, by this point, uh, we were married 10 years. We had coasted, traveled, had fun, enjoyed each other, and then bam, we hit yeah. this wall and it almost did us in. And I had to man up because it was my fault. This was not a thing that had no forewarning. Tunisia had been talking to me about handling this particular piece of business and I didn't do it. I failed. One day we started talking about life insurance. Uh-huh. Yeah, we did. Right? Kanetta is the only person in my life that said to me, not that I was interviewing or anything, she said, Beep! I don't need you to have life insurance. Life insurance. What I need you to have is long-term care. It probably took about a good six months to fix us. I would say it took us two to three years to fix us around the finances. The whole house? You mean? Yes. I would Our agree rapport, with that. I would say it took a couple years. And, and, well, and then we did something radical, something somewhat radical. So we were taking the class. We were Wait a working. minute, wait a minute. Yes. Damn, two to three years. That <laughs> 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 wasn't right for a minute. That long. <laughs> <laughs> 
we knew what our strengths were and you know I knew that was a strength of hers and being very meticulous about our budget and so um, yeah. you know it, it, it's, it's it's gone well and it'll continue to go well because you know the, we've made that commitment to each other that we're, we're going to be financially responsible and teach our kids to, to, to do that as well. We lived in my mother's 600 square foot basement for two years together. Three. Three years in total. Three. Right. Yeah. And so we had a bed, a TV, a dining room table, <laughs> a refrigerator. <laughs> we had a four bedroom house in Farmington Hills. We put everything in storage. Mm -hmm. And Within that time, Kari's rapport with my mom, my rapport with Kari, we were together all the time, one bathroom, and we were like chilling. Like we were so content and we were so happy. Like, and so we were, but we were also accomplishing our goals. Growing up, I was never taught about long-term care mm -hmm. because I think in our community, we're just, it's a lot of things that we aren't taught. So we're always taught to have life insurance. Yep whether it be term or hole or whatever. And for people who ha who don't have kids, I had to learn as well, sometimes you can have too much insurance. Yeah. And it's not needed on the money that you're paying out. That's right. Because of your situation. So instead of me having, we'll just say, $5 million worth of life insurance, but no long-term care, and something happens, and you're spending five to seven to eight Gs a month in order just to... To, to have an existence. Have an existence, and you don't got that cash? I said... Oh, okay, I get it now. Let me get this one. She light skin with some big yams. And she gonna tell me that? Let's ride. Sex. <laughs> <laughs> he always make it seem like we okay, whatever. No, we ain't no, it's cool. I do hood wink. Bamboo <laughs> bamboo. A <laughs> lot more sex in the beginning. <laughs> A little bit less now. That's really how you sum it up. <laughs> in the beginning. That was the world. Now, man. It's never stopped. <laughs> it's just as good now Jim as says, it I was. Don't hear it. And I always like to say it's more seasoned than now. Leave we had alone. a great <laughs> sex life. How do you like that? <laughs> to this day, you can see. <laughs> she was very aggressive. Um, you know, which was an issue for me. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> definitely slowed down I mean mm -hmm. but I wouldn't call it slow <laughs> <laughs> she basically said what up with them draws that's basically what she said basically in so many words she said what's up on the draws uh, from the beginning it, it wasn't great because like we had both oh. saved ourselves so it's like it, it wasn't anything that you thought it would be and so Not it was just trying to <laughs> Figure it out more or less. It was it was, it was much more frequent at the beginning. Now I got two kids in the house. Got a sixteen year old, so he know what's going on. Keeping that door closed, and, and he be trying to get it in. Like he right there, the kid. Can we wait till Wednesday when we have an empty house? We got a pre plan. Like yeah, no, I can't. Uh, I'll let you later. Me, yeah, like <laughs> you cool? I'm cool. All right. All right. <laughs> I think oh, it's better. Off the chain now, I think you know. It's better. We might be outside with I it mean, later on. Oh you my never life. know. It has definitely elevated. We're very happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's always, it's always been good, but you know, I mean, you're young, so. But as you get older, you do get better and better. But you, you, you better, <laughs> you better get better. I mean, some people I know, you know, y'all know people too that there's couples that tell me like. I get it once a month or something like. Sex is a way of connecting at a level of creativity that is spiritual, that is emotional, and you need that. So some people believe that sex is just for procreation. But what if you don't ever have no kids? You're not supposed to have sex? Oh no, sex is wonderful. And I always say because God made sex, you should absolutely be enjoying sex. And you should be enjoying sex often because sex has physical benefits to the male and the female. And so if you wanna have a good, healthy life, if you want your heart to be healthy, if you want your blood to be pumping, if you want all of that to happen into your latter years, sex on a regular basis is necessary. I do think that, actually I don't think, I know intimacy is what brings us close and keeps us close through through all of the different 
times of our life. I mean, obviously there's a lot of, a lot that goes on in a marriage um, on a day-to-day basis, but I do think that that yeah. maintaining intimacy is is a huge part of maintaining the connection between us. Yeah. And it's more physical, and it's not just sex in general. It's, you know, the intimacy that we have, like, you know, going for a walk and, and holding hands and, you know, those little things mm-hmm. and, you know, knowing each other's love languages that really um, make our sex life so much better. And I think the fact that we communicate and have intimacy outside of the bedroom I think that makes everything in the bedroom all that much more special. It took us, I want to say about a year, maybe a year, maybe even a year and a half to like really get into a good rhythm of what makes us both feel good and um, now it's awesome. In coaching couples, uh, I tell them that it is important to be honest and open about what you like, what you interested in trying, and what are your fantasies because at some point there is something that you might have wanted to try that you've never tried or something that you want to do that you've never done it should be exciting you should begin the day flirting with your mate you should uh, text them in the middle of the day and say oh you know what you you don't want for me and when that is missing yes you should immediately either seek out counseling maybe go to an adult store i do advocate those because adult stores have things for adults for adult activities and toys are not the only thing that you can do there are uh, games that you can play games uh, card games uh, board games different things to just keep your mind thinking differently about your sex life we feel (laughs) um like we we are having something great about it we'll express it if we feel like we're not then we will if Mm -hmm. someone's not feeling like they're being satisfied or they are it's always expressed you know tunisia alluded (laughs) to this earlier um but you know when you've been married 21 years you know intimacy always has to be a topic of conversation yeah you know that's (laughs) i think i think it's no honestly i think it's a constant challenge (laughs) It you know, is. because and Tunisia and I used to have this interesting conversation because, uh, again, we talk about everything, mm-hmm. but we openly question, you know, if, if human beings are naturally monogamous in the first place. We have difficulty with monogamy. As humans, we have difficulty with it just because of how we're made. And so the thing that makes monogamy possible is when we use our intellect to have an understanding and we make the decision that that's what we're going to do because you're always gonna have stuff thrown at you. You're always gonna have somebody that um, you have chemistry with. So chemistry and connection are not the thing that makes a relationship work. I may have chemistry with my mate, then go to the gas station and run into somebody and be like, ooh, oh, okay, hey. No, so you make a decision. But if a person has stepped outside of the marriage and been uh, and, and, and cheated and things of that nature, that person, is the responsible party. That person can't say, well, I'm not connected with my mate and he wasn't doing this for me because that was your excuse. And if you're going to move past it, forgiveness is necessary. And so if I am in the position where I need to be forgiven, I need to know how to apologize. There's a language to apology. You have to understand how the person is feeling. You need to let them explain how they're feeling. And then you have to know how are you going to make recompense. You got to know what it is for them to feel like I'm not going to be there again. And if you can't honor that, then you're never going to get past it. Because some people will never get past it. But some people can actually forgive if they're given what they need to feel that they can begin to build that trust again. I be losing sleep, yeah, my mind get the racing. I be in the streets, the only way I know. Long as I can breathe, you be my medication. I know what I need, somebody take me back home. Cause I been going hard. Listen bro, you got a beautiful family, a lovely wife, man. Life is too short to be messing all that up. Just because y'all in the same room at the same time, I don't mean you spending time with her. You gotta give your wife that undivided attention, man. She always wants to talk. Well, you think about this. Maybe that's her way of saying she wants to spend time with you, man. Please believe it. If you don't spend time with her, somebody else will. And guess what else? Don't say it. I get it. 
listen, I know you want attention. I get it. We all want attention. Mm -hmm. But not at the risk of losing your marriage. It's it's not worth it. It's not worth losing your family. You need to cut it off with David. You don't want it to get any worse. Seriously, bro. You don't want to be old and single. Trust me, you too ugly to be the single ugly dude getting with the young girls at the club. Ugh. And you can take that to the bank. Cash it! <laughs> I'm hungry. That whole week leading up to her, her dying was very interesting because uh, on Monday, that Monday, she and I had um, a text message argument. Well, we, she sent me something. She had to go to the doctor and I um, apparently did not show the kind of concern that she thought I should have shown. The sequence of the, the losses was that my mom in August, uh, in early August, passed away of a heart attack shortly after my dad was put into this facility. And she literally was driving down the highway and had a massive heart attack and died. We went out to eat and I ordered a drink. And then so did she. And I said, well, didn't your doctor say you couldn't drink? This is the day before she passed. And she said, I gotta live a little. And we toasted, tink. And I was like, all right, baby. You know what I'm saying? It was like, almost like she was like, even though I might be declining, we can't figure out what it is, I'm gonna make sure that I live a little bit. And I'm glad she did because she wouldn't, that, would've, that was her last drink. Our daughters were home. They had come back because he had been in and out of the hospital. And they came back home the day before he passed away. And they spent that entire day with him. That was the, the first loss. And then my dad did go into facility. And he, um, you know, he, he hung in there. And uh, he was, um, but, but he had dementia and he was uh, suffering the, uh, you know, just from 84 years old and dementia that was developing. And uh, he ended up passing in February, um, so just a few months ago, and just six months after mom passed. So this particular day, um, our grandson was coming. He was just two, was he two? He was just two then. And by my daughters being here, they were excited about him coming, and I was excited. So I had gone to the office the day, but the, my daughters had not gone that day because uh, they were preparing for the grandson coming up. And then just th a little over three weeks ago, uh, my uh, brother immediately, younger for me, uh, I was 55 years old, I'm 57. He passed away from alcoholism and uh, he um, had, uh, he just never, he never got it. I was at a place in Hazel Park and it was Michael Jackson's birthday. And um, Ann DeLisi from WDET was hosting it with me. She was hosting it and I was DJing it. She's one of the, the WDT's biggest personalities. The, the whole idea was that WDT was trying to drive business to this one location. And so she dipped in for a second and she and I took a picture together and then she left. And I looked at the picture and I realized it was blurry. I'll never forget, 
I ran in. I didn't run in, but I was there. I visited with him for a minute. He wanted uh, some clothing. I said, I'll bring it to you tomorrow. And um, I kissed him. And as I went to the door, I looked back at him. I said, what kind of look is that? And he didn't say anything. From the moment I met her, she always talked about her dad. And, and you know, her dad this and her dad that. And, you know, and when I met him, I seen all, I seen it in person, you know, and just having a close relationship with him. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't like a father-in-law to me. He was like, that was my father. But I had to post it anyway, because I was trying to drive some traffic on social media to the venue. And so I put on there, I said, tonight is going to be a blur. We came home, and about 1 o'clock that night, my phone rang. And I got the call that uh, from the resident that was on duty who said, we tried to resuscitate him. We tried. He was in a panic, and the rest is kind of a blur. I knew that one day I was going to have to prepare for this, and I knew that that was probably going to have to be the hardest thing that I ever have to deal with with her is her dad passing, because that was her superhero. That was her everything, you know. Yeah, I'm her husband and all that, but I know her dad love is up here, way up there. So when it happened, the only thing I could do is just take control of everything and be there for her because it's nothing I can tell her. About an hour later, my phone was blown up. The person who I mentioned to you mentioned Cedric and Monique's best friend, Kim, were over here banging on the door and they, they were texting and calling me saying Monique is not answering the door. And I said, y'all fools, y'all going to scare my wife. I know her. She's up there, you know, in the bed. Y'all over there bugging her. She's like probably not trying to deal with y'all today. <laughs> it was a rough time in our marriage. And I know, you know, a lot of people um, may have rough, rough times in a marriage because of the marriage. But I think this was more like a test to see if, uh, if we could come together and, and work through this. Um, and, and we got through it, you know, we had some unfortunate circumstances along the way because I did lose my mom, which was a, a real tough thing for me to um, accept. I rush home, I get here, it's like 10.30 when I get in, when I come through the house, through the door, and I go in the garage, and I see that her car isn't in there. If you can imagine living with someone for 46 years, and then they're not there. So we're rushing downtown to where her car is parked. All the while, we're calling hospitals. Uh, call Henry Ford, and we call Detroit Receiving. Find out she's a Detroit Receiving. They rush, I get there, they rush me back to where she is. And I see her, and she's laying there. And I'm like, hey, babe, hey, babe, how you doing? And she says, she says, uh, hey, you found me. And I was like, yeah, I found you. Sometimes the loneliness is unbearable. Um, I talk to him a lot um, and ask him why, why you didn't tell me were you sick, sicker than you were saying you were. Um, and I go get her mother. And her mother stays back there for a long time, what seemed like a long time to me. And when her mother came out and I saw that she was disheveled and her mascara was kind of running, I knew things weren't, I knew something wasn't right. And that's when she said that they had put her on a ventilator. And I was like, I knew what that meant. I knew that meant it wasn't looking good. Um, long story short, you know, she was pronounced dead at 4.30 that morning. The loss is just great. It's, it's just great because you, you think about 46 years. It was really more than 46 because it would have been our 47th, you know, had he, had he lived.
you you think you know, but you don't know until times are are at you know the roughest, right? When it's when times are low, when it's really when you hit rock bottom, and then you got somebody that's there in your corner with you, fighting with you while they're going through all this shit that they're going through. That's when you know that you really found them. Hey, can we come and talk? No, he can't talk. We trying to watch the game. Hey, go make that right. Listen, baby, David isn't anyone. He's just a friend from work, and I told him not to text me. Baby, I love you, and I'm sorry, okay? But he was showing me some attention that I wasn't getting from you. I know. I'm sorry. I love you. I love our family. I don't want to throw that away. So it's us against the world? Us against the world. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! Yeah! If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. I'd hammer in the evening all over this land. I'd hammer out justice. I'd hammer out glory. <laughs> I'd hammer out love, love between, between my brothers, brothers and my sisters, sisters all over, over this land. <laughs> Why do I love her? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a plethora. You're supposed of to be things. turning to me. You're supposed to look I'm, at me. But I'm thinking, I'm trying to pull me. it out first. Why do I love you? Why couldn't I love you? I mean, you're the best person in the world. Mm. That's exactly mm. right. There was not even a matter of choice, no effort. Huh? Okay, girl, babe. <laughs> Why do I love you? I love you because of the person that you are, the person you have become and how you love me and my family, and how you deal with my bullshit. Mm -hmm. I will, I will, you know. So you admit you be on some bullshit. I love you um, because I think that you're incredible, you're kind, you're a hard worker, and you are in it. You're in it, you're all in with me. You bring out the best in me. You challenge the parts of me that need to be challenged. You just, are forever fighting for our family. I love you because you have made my life happier mm. and better mm. and more wonderful mm. than anyone ever could. Mm. And you have brought me out of all my mm. problems and shells and issues, mm. turned me into the mm. luckiest. All right. Shut up and kiss me. <laughs> Happiest. <laughs> I love you because you are a great father, you're a great provider, and you're a great communicator. I don't be on bullshit all the time, but you deal with, you deal. You just said you, you don't be on bullshit, don't be on bullshit with, all the time. He deals with me, my mouth sometimes when I'm trying to explain certain, like right now. See, this is my dog. And when I say it's my dog, where I come from, from Detroit, like someone who's your dog, like that's your, that's your everything. I love her because um, I feel like God put us together and this is the way it was meant to be. God made me do it. <laughs> God made you do it, man. Yes, Did he really make you do it? it? Yes. <laughs> well, if he made you do it, he must have made me take it. I love you because you're beautiful and you're my best friend and you do put up with my disorganization and my clutter. Um, you put up with some of my crazy sports things I love doing and video games and hockey and, and just my crazy life in general and the fact that I haven't gotten everything figured out yet and that you stick by me and continue to encourage me and point me to God is awesome. I love you because you make me a better person. You make me a better me. Ditto. No. Ditto. I love you because the same. I mean, you make me a better person. I mean, you're a great mother. You're a great wife. You know, and I can imagine doing this partnership and this marriage with anyone else. Aww. I love you because the you're resilient. You take things and actually try to do them. You're you're a work in prog progress, and you you say that, but you do that. 
you show that you allow me to have my kitties and my family and be close to them and you haven't forced me to move even though you've wanted to. <laughs> um, and I love the fact that you said at one point in time, I'll go to church with you. I love you because you have the same heart that you had when I first met you. You have an irresistible personality. We, we, we work well together and I love you. There's so many reasons why I love you, Lamont. Don't give me that. Uh, Boo! Don't give me that. So I love Lamont because the one thing, there are not many people in this world that I know would die for me. Just because I'm me. In fact, I've only known two people. Well, two men. And that's my daddy. What about that dude you dated you. in high school? I never dated anyone before you. I've been waiting. But see, AJ, I love you because uh, to be <laughs> even though when you met me, I didn't have a license. You know, oh, you still, God. you know, you still, you know, got in the car oh, with me and let me give you a ride home. You did. You know? Yeah, and I didn't, you know. So just understanding me for being me, like I said, I'm not a perfect person, you know. I love you for letting me grow and growing with me. I love you because you always go above and beyond and making me even appreciate myself and take care of myself and look out for me. Mm. I still love you for your patience and your strong will to get back everything that you deserve. I've always loved your spirit and your energy. And you're an awesome woman and an awesome mother and a good friend. You make me happy. I couldn't be any happier if I had a million dollars and was living on St. Martin Island. You find as hell. And you make me feel special. You treat me like no one has ever treated me before. You always come through. Even though you that's what you always say, I always come through. Always come through. And I don't want to give you the credit for that. Like, but it just hurts my heart to give you the credit. <laughs> but you do. You do. You always come through. You honor and respect not only me, but just the journey we've been on and the ups and downs that we've had. You've you, you've hung through the, the tough times and um, stood by me um, through my worst and through my best. You are easily the best friend I've ever had. Um, and you continue to expect the best for me. I love you because you, first of all, the man of God. I can respect you. I can allow you to lead me. I love you because you just, you've made me a better person all around. I appreciate you and you're my biggest blessing. Allowing me to be your husband, to, to not, I'm not gonna say take control, but to, to be a leader mm -hmm. in reference to our home. You know, knowing uh, and us working together. Um, I love you for so many, so many reasons of that, because of that. I respect the power of your leadership. And to have another leader next to me, when I've always been the leader of any situation ever, and to have a leader that I can look at and say, this is a leader and I can look up to you and admire you and allow you to lead me at times when I need it. I can do that with you and that's serious and it's powerful and I really appreciate that and I love you for that. You've completed everything that I could ever ask for in a woman. So I love you so much and you know that too. And that's, I'm, I'm very happy that you know that you know that. You know, we know each other. Our love for each other is, is um, 100%. So, I love you, Give me some sugar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the way you accept me. Yeah, because I keep your ass humble. Yeah, he ain't but, shit but, to but, me. But, he but, tired. But this, this, this is my no, part. No, I'm just saying people See, I just try to take control. Y'all just told me. Y'all just told me. See, y'all just told me to turn to her and see how she took it over. What else you got to say? Nothing. Nah, <laughs> shit. You just said it all. <laughs> Next. Marriage is not easy. Marriage is not something that you just show up and it's every day is perfect. And, you know, sure, there's little hiccups along the way. It takes work. But I can't think of a single thing in life that is worth anything that didn't take work or that doesn't take work. Marriage is work. Work. 
with the right person is work. It's never going to be easy. You really need to uh, establish a part of yourself that's all about the other person. You can't be, you know, 100% me and your mate being 100% me and that's just cause for conflict. You try to do for the other, you put the other before yourself in the sense. If you're having difficulties um, and you feel you can seek professional help, get professional help. Don't be ashamed to, to be um, counseled. Don't be, don't be ashamed of counseling. Feelings come and go. And there's gonna be times where you look at him and you're like, he's the best looking guy I've ever seen. And there's times where I absolutely, you know, could just like punch him. Acceptance. You know what, you gotta accept because certain things aren't gonna change, right? And so if you can't accept about the person you're gonna marry, you probably shouldn't marry him. Communication, compromise, sacrifice. Keep trying to push forward through whatever challenges you may face, talk about them, don't push them under the rug, don't try to step on them and stomp them out. Get them out, talk through them, and figure it out. You gotta unpack your shit and deal with it. Marriage is just about learning how to love the same person over again in different ways, and I think that's a reflection of us growing individually and having different struggles and trying to incorporate that into working together as a team. But if you're with somebody that you feel you're bonded with and you know that person is actually worth going through those struggles with, then think it over. You know, don't make irrational decisions. As you get older, you also understand is that you probably got more days behind you than you have ahead of you. So true. So what you got to figure out is these days that you got ahead of you, you know, how do you figure out to make the best of those days? You have to control like those ups and downs of life by going, you know what, this is a feeling and these, I'm going to get that other feeling back. I can get that other feeling back because I loved that person at one time. And go back to what made you love that person. You need to re-examine your vows. Put God first and pray together. Start there and remember why you got married in the first place. Figure out why things aren't working mm -hmm. because it's a two-way street when you're in in a sport when you're in a ring you know one person has to drop their guard another person has to keep hitting mm -hmm. if both people realize that that they have to be in the game and fight mm -hmm. then something's going to happen that's going to bring that relationship to the next level. If you love this person and you really did fall in love with them and you committed to them, there's a reason you fell in love with that person you wanted to marry, marry them in the first place. And this idea that when something comes up, I'll just bail and everything will be good. I just don't think it works that way. It's not gonna always be peaches and cream. It's not gonna be always guns and roses. It's gonna be, you know, a lot of things that you have to go through, you have to deal with, but you have to know in your heart that this is what you really want taking it day by day, but, and, and then also, you no know, bending and not breaking, right? Because marriage is a compromise, um, it's a, a give and take, and it's more importantly the work that you, you have to put into it, and you gotta be willing to do so. Find yourself again before you try and find mm. someone else. Mm. Because a lot of times in marriage, you give so much of yourself that you forget who you were before you got married. Mm -hmm. So you give up the things that you used to like to do. You stop doing those things so that you can cater to the other person. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're divorced, I would say, go back to who you were. Find out what you used to like to do and start doing those things all over again. Build yourself up before you try and go and get into a relationship. Be healed completely of the last, the previous relationship before you go into another one. When, when you have a situation like the one that I've just gone through where I have a very healthy wife up until this point and she suddenly dies, all the things that you did not do rush into your head. You know, all the things you did not say rush into your head. All the things you wish you could have done you know, better rush into your head. You know, a lot of the things that, uh, you know, that people who still have their mates, um, 
you know, don't realize are the things that they could do better. It's like you might have a great marriage, but what can you do better? If you're thinking about throwing in the towel, that means you're in the game. Mm -hmm. if, 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 you, if, you, if you're indifferent or you're numb, it's scarier. then that's a lot scarier. But if you're thinking about throwing in the towel, that means you're in the game and you want something more. But that more isn't outside of the game. It's not outside of the marriage. It's not outside of starting over another journey with someone else who you think is going to fulfill that same journey, knowing you're gonna to have to go through those exact same steps, the exact same hoops, only with a different person who has different characteristics, idiosyncrasies, all those things, you're gonna to have to go over again. You should talk about what goals do you have as a couple? What things do you want to see your couple do in the world? Because at the end of the day, when you become a couple, you should impact the world around you together. Finally. Now, can we watch the game? Yes, man. Yes. We can watch the game now. Ready? Am I hitting it right? What is hitting it right? What is it?